Today we're going to be talking about inquiry. And inquiry is a really neat word that means to ask questions or to investigate. And whenever you're going to do this process of investigating or inquiring about things, there's a very nice kind of step-by-step -step thing that you can go through in order to get to some really neat and interesting results. So let's talk a little bit about variables. Now the word variables by itself has the definition kind of hidden within it. When you look at the word variables, you see two parts, very and able. Now we already know that the suffix able means what it says, able. So let's look at the root word, which is very. Now the word very is not like I like you very much, what? but more like V-A-R-Y, like things can change. Oops. Or they can vary from one time to the next. So the word variable all by itself already means able to change. In scientific experiments, it's really important that we know what types of variables we want to change and what types of variable variables we don't want to change. Got me? Let's hope so. So when you're talking about variables, you can classify them into three different parts. One type of variable is called independent variable. Now an independent variable is something that stands alone. It actually is the only thing that you're permitted to change in the experiment so that you can see if what results you get are because of that one thing you manipulated or changed. Got me? Let's hope so. Notice I use the word manipulated. Oftentimes I like to refer to the independent variable as the manipulated variable. So manipulate means to kind of control, like a puppeteer might do to his puppets. He manipulates them to make them move in the way that he wants them to move. In a scientific experiment, the scientist, which would be you in this case, chooses how to manipulate or change things in the experiment so that we can see what results occur. Got me? Let's hope so. Hmm, what results occur would be the dependent variable, the things that are uh, responding, if you will, to the experiment and the things that you are measuring is your dependent variable. And if you look at that word dependent, the entire experiment gives you a result and the answers you get depend on what you changed or manipulated on purpose. Got me? Let's hope so. There is a nice little relationship and it works together a lot like a cause and effect relationship. If this is changed, then this is the result. Got me? Let's hope so. Now there's one other kind of variable and it's sometimes overlooked, but without it, we would not have a very fair test. And that is called controlled variables or also known as constant variables. I like the word constant because when you say it, it means same. Now these are the variables that are not allowed to be different. In a way, it's kind of an oxymoron. Hey. What did you call me? An oxymoron is when you have two words that kind of contradict each other, like old and news. They're kind of opposites, but you can have old news. Well, a constant variable kind of means to say, this is staying the same, but it's able to change. Got me? Let's hope so. If you don't control these constant variables, then too many things could be different, and that's what causes the fair to be un uh, <laughs> and that's what causes the test to be unfair. And we go through these kind of things all the time when we're ever playing sports or games. We kind of say that's not fair because there were certain rules that had to be the same for both teams. In an experiment, the same thing is true. You need to have the same types of variables in one, and another one that's basically. And, hi, <laughs> and you also have to have, oh, beef nougats. A -a -a Boom, a -a -a I don't know what I was saying there. To talk about constant variables, it will be easier to kind of explain them in an actual example, a real life experiment. So, so I'll be right back because my telephone is ringing and um, apparently I gotta go answer it. A -a 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 Boom, a jigga, jigga. When discussing constant variables, it makes it a little bit easier to talk about it in a context of a real example. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and talk about a real life experiment that we did in class and make the connections with independent variable, dependent variable, and some constant variables that would be important in the experiment. I'll be right back. Okay, so I got my soccer ball. Now, in this experiment, what we are going to do is the question or purpose of our investigation is this. Does the amount of air make the weight of a soccer ball different? 
or does it change it? Got me? Let's hope so. Now, in that question, I just identified two very important variables. One, what I'm going to manipulate, and what I'm going to be looking for as a response, which I will eventually measure and graph and so forth. A chicka chicka, boom, a chicka chicka. Well, the thing I'm manipulating is the amount of air in the soccer ball. I'm going to change on purpose the amount of air I pump into this soccer ball. And then, using a tool called a scale or a balance, I will then weigh the soccer ball, find out how much it weighs, and that will determine if what I manipulated caused a difference in weight. And thusly, thusly, there's a word to look up and use every once in a while. Maybe not. I wouldn't recommend it. It's kind of a weird word. No, I mean, we don't live in England or ancient times. A chicka chicka, boom, a chicka chicka. So after measuring the soccer ball, I will have been able to determine did the amount of air I put in it change its weight or not. A chicka chicka, boom, a chicka chicka. All right, so I've identified my independent variable amount of air, and I've identified what I'm going to be measuring, which is my dependent variable, that would be weight. So what kind of constant variables would I need to consider when doing this experiment? Well, I probably don't want to change soccer balls halfway through my experiment. I don't want to use an inflated soccer ball and then choose another soccer ball that's been deflated and try to compare the two of them, because each ball is made up of slightly different materials, possibly. Even if you were to go out and buy the exact same soccer ball, it's possible that there was a little bit more thread used, a little bit more of the material that surrounds the ball and the skin of it. So in order to keep things fair and constant, the only thing I'm going to manipulate is the air inside of it. I don't want to add anything else but air to the soccer ball. Got me? Let's hope so. Just to kind of keep things normal, I'm going to use the same scale, even though using a measuring device really shouldn't matter, it's probably a good idea just to keep that the same too. Now, I might want to consider my environment. If I was outside weighing this, and it was kind of a windy day, it's possible the wind might affect the weight on the scale. So I got to consider all these extra things, and pretty much just make sure I create everything, 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 everything should be the same, except for one thing. The independent variable. That's why it's called the independent variable, because it's the only variable that's allowed to be different. So, when I pump up this soccer ball, I can weigh it, and I'll find out how it responds. Okay. A chicka chicka. Boom, a chicka chicka. Got me? Let's hope so. So I want to talk a little bit about observations. Whenever you're doing an experiment, you're going to have to make some kind of observations. You're going to have to either record things down on paper, draw pictures, calculate some things, measure th some things. There's just lots of different things that you need to observe. Well, we've classified these two types of observations, qualitative versus quantitative. Very similar words, but when you break them down and you look at their roots, you see the word quality versus quantity. Now, by themselves, those tell you the difference between the two. I'm going to start with quantity first. When you think about quantity, you think about numbers and amount. And that's exactly what a type of observation quantitative is. I almost stumbled on the word quantitative. It's a lot of syllables. When you see the word quantitative, you know you're going to be measuring something with numbers. So scales, rulers, uh, anemometers, whatever tool you can think of that has some sort of gauge or measuring device on it is going to be quantitative. But over here, you've got qualitative. Quality doesn't really give me a hint right away, but if I look closer, I see the L for qualitative, and I use the L. I, I don't know why, but I do. And it makes me think about look, how things look. And it's not just about how things look, it includes all the five senses. So while I'm looking at it, I can also see what, um, uh, or not see, obviously that would be look, but I can also smell, taste, touch, and feel to make qualitative observations. Now those are a little bit more difficult to show in graphs, so that's why when you make an observation you should include both worlds, and really the most easiest one to 
And really, uh, I'm coming to it. And really, the um, the most, and really, scientifically, and so you know, just so that you think you feel this, when you know this, and sometimes, look, listen, the most scientific, the, the way that you can argue things, look, when you make a scientific observation, it is easier to use a quantitative observation to prove your point. Sometimes it is more difficult to use a qualitative value to show and prove that that's what really happened because smells and tastes and things, those can all be kind of a physical, personal reaction. But quantitative, there really isn't anybody with a disagree that if you measured something or weighed something, that that's the exact amount you got. So it's a little bit more scientific because no one would argue that your results are correct. So quantitative is where I always start first, but I don't ever forget the qualitative portion because sometimes drawing a diagram is a good visual for people to see. Got me? Let's hope so. When you take both worlds and you put them together, you get a very nice scientific observation. A -jerka -jerka. Boom, a -jerka -jerka. For just a moment, I want to talk a little bit about the process, about what you do first, what you do second, and so forth, as you start to generate an idea. Well, that kind of tells you right there, the first thing that you do when you're doing something of inquiry, you have a question or a problem that needs to be solved, and that identifies your purpose right there. Something needs to be answered, and the only way to get that answer is by doing some further investigating or further testing. So the first step of any kind of inquiry is to establish the purpose. Why or what is the question? Got me? Let's hope so. Now, the next step then is to try to gather some information, to maybe do some background research. Uh, that doesn't mean that you have to just get on the internet and read books, but you might do some field research and go out and look at things and try to make observations initially. It also could involve talking to other people. But you get some background to start generating some inferences about what you think might be a solution and how you might approach that test. Once you've got a good background, then you can generate a reasonable hypothesis. And the hypothesis is basically a testable statement that has some reasoning behind it. It's not just a simple guess that says, ah, I predict this will happen. It's got some real good background to it, and that's what makes it testable. Now, after the hypothesis has been formulated, then you start to extract other things like materials, procedures. What's the plan that you need to get together in order to make this test come together as a whole? You start looking at what variables need to be tested and which need to be controlled, and ultimately, what am I gonna measure to prove what I came up with is actual? Now, once you got all that going, then your blueprint is ready and you can start testing. And as you're testing, you're making those qualitative and quantitative observations to create a very nice scientific observation, and all those together start to create your results. Now you've got some results. This is the best part of the entire experiment because now you can start analyzing the question and your results to see if you have an answer. Got me? Let's hope so. Once you've generated that conclusion, then you can start making some reflections. Um. Is there a new way to make this test? Is there a new test that might help you learn more about this topic? And you can start to revise your test even. Sometimes when you get to this point, your conclusion is kind of weird and you're not really sure that what you did was correct. And you made this hypothesis that you thought was right, and you found out it was actually not supported. What? Well, that doesn't mean that you've made some huge mistake. It just means that your results don't agree with your hypothesis. So either you, one, keep retesting, and if you keep retesting and trying over and over again, you keep getting the same answer, then perhaps your hypothesis is what needs to be revised. Or, possibly, your test itself may not have been a very valid test, and it's not really testing the question anymore. So at the end of any point where you get data and you get to your conclusion, it's not just the end. There's still time to go back and revise and look at this again and look at the whole process. And it's basically just a cycle, like a big circle, just keeps on going. You finish your work, you come back and you look at it. It just keeps going over and over again and the wheels on the bus go round and round. I don't know if that uh, particular song is copyrighted, so we may not want to sing that on this show. I don't have a, I don't have any, do you have any money? No, no, I didn't think so. So this cycle continues until you get enough data to support or refute, which means to go against 
your original hypothesis. That in itself is the scientific process. Got me? Let's hope so. Okay, so I'm just going to leave you with this closing thought. The scientific method or the inquiry process, whatever title you want to give this entire uh, kind of step-by-step -step cycle, is not only applied within the walls of a classroom setting. These are things and decisions you make all the time. Anytime you make a decision about something and then you adjust your decision based on your, your uh, feelings or your perceptions is all about changing variables and responding to things and continuing to manipulate them. It's, it's a continuous process. I've used the example before that anytime you've added seasoning to your food, you add a little bit of seasoning, you take a bite, you don't like it, so you add a little bit more seasoning, you take another bite. That right there is you manipulating how much seasoning you had and then measuring your response to see if you liked it. And that's science. So I encourage you to keep doing science, look for ways to inquire, and I'll see you next time. Huh? And dependent is something I, that is responding. That is responding. <clears throat> One way that I like to look at these words is by, uh, <laughs> that's going to go in the bloopers. So, mm. A chicka chicka, boom, a chicka chicka. I don't know what I was saying there. Got me? Let's hope so.